So thinking about uh, performance, um, these wonderful series of, of uh, uh, performance lectures that, that, that Andy's working on, it's, it's a great initiative and I think, hope it's going to go on and on. Every time I've come to a performance previously by a lecture, I've kind of rethought what I was going to do uh, and, and, and thought about the idea of performance. But I had to sort of settle down a bit on that. Um, and so I just want to say a few things, first of all, about uh, my notion of performance. Then a little thing about natural metaphor, why that's the title of this. Then I genuinely want to give you some time to look at this stuff. Uh, and out of that may well come some kind of conversation. But don't worry, if it doesn't, I've got lots of other stuff to do. So uh, if it doesn't work out that way, it'll work out some other way. Um, so thinking about performance, uh, performance as a uh, um, sort of artist that I am that makes objects uh, and some films uh, is I think different from the way we might normally think of performance in relation to the theatre or we might think of performance in relation to uh, music. Um, and I've always been kind of slightly envious of that, you know, the, the equivalent uh, is perhaps, you know, sneaking up behind somebody in an exhibition and trying to hear what they're saying or watch them looking at your work. So I think one of the contexts for performance is this idea that the making uh, and the experience of the work are simultaneous. That in some sense, not in every sense, but in some sense, the making and the experience of the work happen at the same time. And I think that's something that, that kind of interests me and that I'm not kind of used to. That, 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 but is, is suggested by performance. I think in this way as well, uh, a performance is a slightly scary word. Uh, you know, you know, it, it's a word that slightly evokes, you know, maybe you know, childhood fears of are you going to remember your lines or if your costume is going to fall off or you're going to have the mask stapled directly to your head at the last minute, you know, before you're pushed on stage. Um, and, and it has a sort of notion of the real, kind of an edge to it. Uh, and in that sense, I'm, I'm interested in that because uh, I... I kind of like that and, and, and I think, you know, I know it's an incredibly tricky word to use, but I think a sense of the real is, 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 is quite important potentially about, uh, about performance as against something seen on the screen, as against something experienced uh, uh, in, in, in more distant ways. Um, I think also what you know, like about performance here is it suggests, an, and the way it's being used, is it suggests both an extension and a kind of subversion of the lecture. So I think that's really interesting. It, it, it's useful in the sense just to create a, an alternative way of thinking about that. And perhaps it even might become um, a, a, a kind of super genre in the way that Bakhtin talks about the novel as knowing itself precisely because it doesn't know itself. The novel is that form of writing that can always change and is always available to change and is always changing. And we know it because we recognise that experimentation, that change. It would be nice uh, uh, if that was the case. Um, it kind of knows itself because it doesn't know what it is. You know, the novel knows itself because it doesn't know what it is. And I think that's quite a nice idea about these performance lectures. You don't quite know what it is that's going to happen when you come to these. And uh, in a, a rather perhaps dull compared to, say, let's say, a, a fire eater or a lion tamer, I hope that I can keep some sort of sense of not quite knowing what's, what's, what's going to happen. And then finally, uh, and very, very importantly, I think... Uh, performance has a sense of reciprocity about it. You know, I went to a really great concert on Friday and, you know, the, 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 the relationship between not only the making of the experience, but the relationship between the maker and the audience um, in a live concert or the performance is, is, has that sort of dynamic to it. So maybe we can explore some of that. Maybe that's just a, an aside. Maybe that's just um, another statement. The idea of natural metaphor, and I use the image um, on the, the handout, um, is of um, a watercolour uh, palette, a watercolour box. Uh, and for quite a long time, you know, painting since I was, well, you know, seriously, I suppose, since I was 18, um, I've often looked at, sadly, looked at the palette at the end of the day uh, and thought it's so much better than what I painted. <laughs> um, uh, and um, I've tried to sort of kind of liberate myself in a way through that and that was that photograph comes from a time when I was out um, at Avery trying to pretend to be an antiquarian uh, making drawings there I've done watercolors for a long time um, and um, watercolors have 
share with with the idea of painting and 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 to some extent with with mark making in general this idea that they are kind of pigment and a medium yes in water and then crushed up um, color or if you like sort of water and mud and um, what's not here is a whole range of uh, paintings I started doing with mud um, and um, what happened at that time was I realized that instead of painting the landscape um, in a very particular way the painting was the landscape it was a landscape and um, the, 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 the mud would flow into sort of tributaries and valleys and gorges and look like clouds because after all that's they're a sort of aqueous kind of medium too um, and that really that really fascinated me and it led me to sort of trying to make paintings where uh, initially really they were just marks and where the paint and, and the pigment and the mud and the water were, were sort of more or less in charge and I was just kind of following following that so in that sense natural also in an, in, in in another sense the kind of idea of um, nature really interests me and I think nature's I predict nature's making a comeback I'm not the only person that that's predicting that but you know 10 years ago to talk about nature you were sort of vilified because after all wasn't nature just a, a, a social construct um, and um, something you know, if you talked about anything that was natural then you were just denying this this kind of collective eye this the social imaginary and things but seeing as how nature seems to be wreaking its revenge on us uh, and that we're probably going to be you know sort of uh, uh, dead because of nature well certainly but maybe before our time uh, and wiped out as a race and anywhere in the Anthropocene uh, allegedly uh, that nature's making making a, a, a kind of comeback so I'm interested in uh, in, in, in nature too as this uh, natural metaphor and then finally the whole of my art education really was um, consisted of one hand learning to draw well and, and being able to just draw and draw and draw which I just seemed to find was something I wanted to do um, but also when I started getting into art education it was this curious thing of um, expressivity of looking into oneself that the idea was that there was some sort of subject matter that was inside uh, and that was near, it was of an ongoing disaster for me because I was fairly convinced although not able to articulate it at the time that the horror was that I didn't have anything inside I didn't have any of this internal stuff that needed to be expressed that seemed to be what you needed to be if I wanted to be an artist but I didn't have this basic material of expressivity and interiority um, to work with uh, but I finally liberated myself now from that because I think that I'm much more interested in as it were not pointing this way but pointing that way and so a lot of my work is I hope just pointing at something uh, and using what I make to point at something which is really nothing to do with me in a in that expressive way but everything to do with me as a, as a, as a human being having to do even arguably with us um, as, a, as, a, as a human being so so that's the, the natural I mean I could talk much more of all these sort of themes that you know uh, you know um, I could lock the door and talk to you to death <laughs> but um, um, so what I thought we could we could do now is um, just have a chance to look around and I thought it'd be quite interesting you might not want to do this but it might be nice if you did and I'd quite like you to do it if you sort of when going around something you notice something particular something just sort of notices it and you kind of possess it a little bit and I mean even that might mean you might want to pick it up and hold it and then you know you might want to we might use that as a basis for a, a conversation the only thing don't pick up is is this beautiful microscope but please do look down it. it's well worth that so over here we've got a kind of little branch of work which is to do with um, the romantics and the romantic notion of nature gone badly awry, as it were, uh, and Caspar David Friedrich, this sort of paternalistic uh, a wanderer figure, a pilgrim uh, in a landscape, and just reworking that. Over here on the black piano, <laughs> like Jules Holland, is the um, um, Nosferatu section. So I've been thinking about the microscopic, which is that table in the middle here. Uh, to do with the microscopic in a way uh, in relation to the film Nosferatu which has a very particular uh, uh, referencing scene of the microscopic um, maybe I could just say that there's a brilliant bit of the Ven of Venus flytrap uh, closing the, the scientist is looking at it quite early on in the film and there's a polyp 
which is attacked by another creature. And this is like microscopic in 1920, huge on the screen. What the impact of that is really, we have to really use our imagination to think what they're being. And it describes this thing as being translucent, a parasite, you know. Uh, and then, of course, the Venus flytrap closes like that. And everybody knows, of course, the scene in Nosferatu where the hand reaches across the woman with the spidery fingers, like long, sharp fingers, and clutches, clutches um, at the heart uh, of this, very much like a Venus flytrap. And I think there's a tremendous analogy of the microscopic. Uh, I could talk more about it, but one of the contexts for that is made in 1920. The Spanish influenza, which killed millions, was, was a, a very real thing. The notion of the masses and how to control the masses, etc. So, not Sferatu, Kano. Um, there's here where I might do some painting, or I might, you might do some painting. Um, there's a, a bit of a film going on here. There's some books and other images and some sculptures here. Please do look at the books, they're very beautiful. There's a whole pile of extra work here, uh, and some stuff here, and some more stuff there. So, I think just um, what's going to happen, Nick is going to go walk about with a camera, so if you feel you know, you want to say something or maybe just want to point at something, that could be nice. Um, then do that. So we'll do that for about five, ten minutes and then see where we get to. Is that okay? Tell us what the film is of. Right? Yeah, the film is uh, made with the help of that superb filmmaker, Ben Rowley. Um, and it's, um, I gave Ben about 20 drawings, none of which are here, but, the, um, um, and um, we're just exploring this idea of, of, a, of, of, of kind of travelling in um, and, and, and losing the scale in that. There's always something behind. So it so gives me the chance to talk about, to about Ruskin. And um, Ruskin is just a genius writer. Um, and one of the things I loved is he talked about, um, he says, we, we, we never see, we never see the, vis we don't see the visible. What we're always seeing is the edge of the invisible. He, he felt that, that, that it was a spiritual process scene, very associated with vision and very associated with, with insight and, and, and the magical, well, the, the religious in his case. But his example was a handkerchief on a hill. When you see it, you see it as a little white blob, then you see it as a white triangle, then you see the, well, see, he was a Victorian, so the initials on the handkerchief, then you see the fibres of the handkerchief, then you see, you know, and it goes on and on and on. So at any one time, what we're seeing okay is what's visible but we're also demarking for ourselves the edge of the of, of, of the visible the beginning of the unknown the, the the absolute edge of that territory and i think you know so anyway okay so please please do uh, have a look around and um see if there's anything that that um talks to you or shouts at you or wants to jump into your pocket or <laughs> run away with you or whatever So weird. It, um, it is absolutely terrible um, art shop. Could you check the name at the top of the yeah. town? Or down the road. Well, forget Chromos. Chromos is gone. But at yeah. uh, the top of the it's town. It's all artwork. Yes. Yeah. 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 And it's just like. Yeah. And it's still there. It do. do you know where it's made? Yeah. It's Indian. Oh, it's Indian. Yeah. I can't remember. Because it's yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, sometimes you, sometimes it's gossamer thin, which is really yeah. great. Yeah, so you actually so you, you get this sort of strange, you know, you get these huge varieties of stuff. You know. Yeah, it's really yeah. nice. But I don't know if actually this, but you see how it's so beautiful on this paper too. Yeah, well, it's it does have different qualities. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, what do you mean, why not? Because the, the reference is there. Hold on. Then. So I'll be thinking about that. I like this wandering around. Yes, me too. 
No, I don't. And that, there's a free song. Still in there. So finding a pattern. And then using it. I think that's what the wall sack should be done. And I think that's a sort of primal fear of certain kinds of things. When you see, a, see something, you know what it is, you want to know what it is. And I want to follow that. I suggest that someone might like grow it. You can see it's more strong and heritage. Mind you, I also see what you draw for the standard you see for these things. No, maybe I'm working on some of the Oh, yes. It's a big link. It's actually, I mean, the best way to describe it now is it's a kind of, um, kind of apology that I'm not going to give away. I want everything to work out somehow. Mm -hmm. so sometimes things just work, which is great. But if they don't work, then they hang around until they do work and then they turn up. Whatever. So I've got a few box with all sorts of packages, another pile of paintings that have work there, and then there's stuff called like a couple of So it's um, it just sort of go along. And it, it's a nice little thing. It's a bit like filmmaking like too, because they're framed, and, and you know, they start to line up, and it matters what order they're in, yeah. you know. So I'm right. hoping to exhibit them. Yeah, that's 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 you mean the same the same ideogram as a total there are there are hundreds that talks with different meaning it means different things because sometimes phrases that are just very confusing not for us no because for them also but do you want to open it? To see, to see if you buy a thing, is, is, is there a very definite sort of reference for flower arranging in, in, in time? Yes, I know. Yes, and, uh, yeah, I think it's a different people. Recording different style. I don't know. I think it's a sort of handbook of uh, how to arrange how flowers. to do it, strange enough. Yeah, all good wow. examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. nice. Gregor Samsa. <laughs> <laughs> He's got his mother's eyes. <laughs> 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 I got a few of them in Millions my hair, I'm afraid. <laughs> I do, yes, I, 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 I do. Mm -hmm. uh, I th you're filming that, you can edit it in, can't you? Yeah, but they won't be able to. Uh, yes, you, yes, okay. Well, let's, if, yes, that's good if you can do that, yeah. Okay. Yeah.
Here we go. You can't go wrong. It's not possible. Just don't spray everything. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. That would be wrong. You see, I'm completely... Uh, can you help me out, Tim? I, I really am... Well, I, I really am frozen and stuck. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, well, that that went went what a mess. That was a, that was a good... Sorry, go on. That was a good... Actually, that, that one was of the interesting is, I mean, Jackson Pollock was a dripper. I'm not a dripper, I'm a, I'm a Jack the Dripper. I'm, I'm a, 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 a painter, so it's actually a brush mark. So, I mean, it's just about how you touch, just exactly. how you touch the paper. So, and, yeah. and 25 so, years of that. So, so, so you've just, done really well there. So just boy. touch it, just touch. See, yeah. see what touch happens. I can't believe you froze. That's some fascinating stuff. Yeah. Certainly not you again, so. Sorry. No, no, it's all right. What the? Has he got size on it? Uh, that is a size paper. Because yeah. it's sitting on the surface for you. It does most, yeah, it does beautifully, actually. And there's quite a high pitch on there. Yeah, it's a Fabiano. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the size of It's very difficult to to be free with with, um, with a tool which you're not uh, one of the I don't know if you, if you think when you, you look at it I mean this was the first of very early you just put the brush down and what, what I think one of the, the extraordinary things is that these there's only a certain repertoire of what you can do with the brush which I guess is a certain repertoire of what you can do with gravity what you can do with gesture what you can do exactly. with water and it seems to, to, to imitate natural forms. Mm. I mean, maybe that's, yeah. a, maybe that's just a given and it's a ridiculously obvious thing to say. But for me, there's something much more profound about that. You're making this sort of, these, these, these sort of um, animacules, these uh, formulafera, these little sort of primal forms um, that, 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 that seem to come out of it. And also, because you're losing is it, again, when you make a deliberate brush mark, or the tradition of making brush marks, is that they're representational. So they refer, and they refer at the level, the optical level of seeing them as a mark. So these refer beyond themselves as marks because you can go into them and they repeat themselves. Mm. They, they have other forms within them that are, as, as, that, that are echoes of the bigger forms and that, that, that go beyond that. So um, as with that film, you know, you, by going up to these drawings um, and zooming into them, you actually have forms which then seem to replicate. replicate but they, I, mean, they I, I, I saw you make them, and yet now they look to me as very intricately and delicately drawn insects. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. I can see the wings, I can see the whole shape of the body. And, and There's a uh, sort of... Um, there's a sort of spinal mark. Yes. There's with a big brush, you can actually create a sort of bouquet. There's a kind of bouquet of these flowers that, that, that you know, that in one brush stroke. I mean, a lot of the early mud ones are one brush stroke. That was a kind of rule I had to to make this image in one. The, 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 if you then replicated it, and I've, I've thought about doing it, but I don't know what the point is in a way, but then repainting it deliberately as though you're copying it. Mm -hmm. It would, you know, be phenomenally difficult yes. and ludicrous activity yes. uh, in a way. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, it, so, so, and I think that's where the natural metaphor comes in because, as well, because when I started thinking about that, it seemed to me that this was something to do with simple forms mm. and something to do with um, the kind of, kind of life and the organic. And um, reading around that has really fed into the work because um, it seems to me that um, the Darwinian thing is such a profound metaphor in our culture. The idea is that, that competition, 
taxonomies which look like class, uh, market forces are actually natural. Survival of the fittest. And, and it's, I think it's a complete and utter con. When you, when you look at it, and you, you know, um, Dar Erasmus Darwin, who was not just Charles Darwin's father, but his grand, grand his, um, he was uh, his grandfather, yes, had this notion that life came from simple forms. Um, the Mark, a much more interesting set of ideas about how evolution works, um, where he doesn't believe in species, for example. He, he just believes in natural forms proliferating. Mm -hmm. And when things get complicated, then they're vulnerable and they die. Mm -hmm. They're not like the sort of icing on the cake in the Darwinian sense or a definition of some natural male leadership. They're actually over-specialised and they, they're doomed to die so that the next sort of proletarian mass of ordinary uh, um, forms kind of, kind of, kind of come, come, come through. Um, uh, so he didn't believe in species, and he also, Lamarck said, he's, he's vilified for having said that giraffes got long necks because they wanted long necks. <laughs> um, right. But in actual fact, he sees it as a kind of dynamic life force, a kind of monism running through all things that, that leads things on. But he's absolutely clear saying, at the point the culture happens, then we have agency, and then you forget this. And Darwin is absolutely trying to say, at the point you have agency, forget it, because you're still driven by what I want to put in there as this kind of you know, market-led patriarchy and taxonomies of class and sophistication. Also uh, no, and, and so actually somehow this becomes a sort of an attack, <laughs> quite a politically based sort of notion of, 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 of rethinking um, really simple forms. That bit over there looks like mm. a Ralph Steadman political cartoon. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, well, Ralph Steadman uses splashes, doesn't he, um, uh, and, 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 and aggressive brush, to suggest a, a certain kind of disgust and a certain kind of sublime. There's a certain kind of disgust yeah. thing going on here as well, I think, of, of these are quite disgusting images. And why that is, it's on, you know, I think there's a number of reasons with that. that well, might be the case. we're talking about splashing, splashing and gesture, and it's projectile, isn't it? As if it's something that's <coughs> been spat out. Mm, mm. I think that's part of it. Mm. But, but I also think some of the forms are, are kind of viral and nasty. Yeah. They look like cockroaches, yeah. which you know, most people are not very able, easy to deal with cockroaches. Or they look like a virus. And we've or learned microbiology. That, we've learned to hate viruses, although I notice now that viruses are coming to our, to our aid, aren't they, as, as cancer eaters? Uh, yes. Which is really interesting. So somehow the whole kind of notion of... And, 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 and actually, whilst I'm saying that, and just to show how bonkers one gets with one's own private thoughts, that this, um, the people writing now who are saying that if this Lamarckian thing is, is this sort of drive um, to, to which, is, uh, which, which another guy has, well, quite close to monism, which is this idea about a driving life force. And is that Spinoza? No. It, it isn't far, I think, from Spinoza. But it, it's actually, I try to put it, it's, 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 it's saying that the process by which um, viruses are now becoming immune to penicillin, yes, is the same process, the same process that Fleming was involved with when he used penicillin to attack viruses. It's a kind of dynamic towards self-preservation. Do, do you see what I'm saying? It's the same process, absolutely the same process. And there's a lot of people writing now about the Anthropocene, strangely enough, because I think artists have known that actually we're beyond the human now, back into some kind of post-human thing. So the Anthropocene is a little bit old-fashioned in that. But they're talking about things like the swarm, the idea of the swarm. Now, the idea of the swarm is that um, if you take, um, uh, say, a sponge, which most of us know to be an organism we can think of, that biologically speaking, they're not single organisms. They're, they're colonies. They're communities. They're these little things coming together for their own benefit to create the, the, the shape of, of the sponge, which, of course, we wouldn't assume that they're conscious of doing. And that what's happening now, that we haven't gone through the sort of stage of evolution to the sort of stage of, um, as it were, human consciousness being the driving force, but we've now surrendered, we've now surrendered our um, control to algorithms, for example. So uh, economics now is driven by algorithms, driven by the fact that economic deals happen 
thousands of times a second and that this is what the fate of, of all of us so is, is in our hand. This is as much defining poverty and, re and wealth and starvation as anything else. So that we are re-inhabiting a kind of digital swarm, <laughs> if you like, where we are all doing something that adds up to some kind of behaviour, but we're none of us able to conceive of what that is. Do, Almost do impossibly that, unable to conceive. Do you think the computer viruses look anything like that, or are they? Well, um, what do mathematical viruses? It's do? interesting when people start making images of the invisible, um, and having to do that by reference to something visible. Um, and there's a lot of sort of very dodgy images out there that, that are enhanced. You know, there's, I saw an image of the Wellcome Trust of, of, of brain transmissions. And there are lots of diagrams and, and images of the internet, for example. And if you look at the internet, they're very rhizomic, very much like the sort of thing that, that Haeckel was talking about in the 1890s and discovering under the microscope. But there, there is a correspondence between how you can actually write a virus in code, basically, mm -hmm. a virus, and how you can define a virus in a codified form. There's a correspondence in the quantity of information you need for both of them. So there, there is some sort of crossover parallel. Mm -hmm. So that if you were going to theorize a virus, then you could do so in the same number of lines. Uh, or number of bits and bytes. Either. I mean, there's that whole thing that's gone out a bit out of fashion, but we call it the, um, the fractal. <coughs> this kind of ability to generate organic forms from very, very simple uh, processes. And, you know, when, when you're repeating a gesture, I mean, if it, it's, it's impossible to, you know, if you try to, to, to define what that gesture is that I'm repeating, the, me the, the variables within that are almost infinitesimal, aren't they? you know, the, the muscles, the hand, the nerve endings, the water, the, mm -hmm. the brush, the, the paper. Um, and yet, you know, these marks do repeat, and yet, of course, they never repeat. There's absolutely no possible ever repetition of any mark ever. It's just not possible. Well, with digital information, it's supposed to be lossless, isn't it? I know, I think it's a bit of a fallacy, but you can reproduce it as a mirror, an absolute mirror. So it has a, that distinction from what you might call the natural, which is oh, always going to have infinite variation. You see, when the matrix is digital, then it can be yeah. reproduced. It's always like a mirror. Always like mirror. itself. Yeah, a, an exact copy rather than a, a I think that's really interesting. Copy. It is. I mean, we have a... I mean, I, when I'm doing these paintings, you know, there's a absolutely kind of mesmerising thing of wanting to just repeat. And... Yeah. and um, I've done that, you know, <laughs> these big paintings are just repeat, repeat, repeat. But, you know, I grew up in a culture, I suppose, where I think repetition was almost synonymous with mass production somehow. But, you know, when you think of people chanting the Quran, for example, or you think of the way that repetition works in other cultures, it's completely, that's it's something else is happening there, I think. And so I think the notion of repetition is, is something that, well, you know, there's you know, Deleuze, I guess, but you know, there's, there's something there which we, I don't get, which I'm able to start getting by, by this process of painting. Yeah, is a reiteration the same as repetition? I think it's, uh, there's some sort of difference, isn't there? Or recognising, or, you know, re-something, re, re, rehabiting, re, reinventing, re, re-experiencing, and... Um, you know, even if that mark was the same, it wouldn't be the same because it's now a mark that was the same, whereas the mark that before wasn't a mark that was the same. If, if that's not Five minutes too for ridiculous. this session, Brian. Okay. There's one thing which um, these marks have in common with the little nymph or whatever is there, that it's a unit of energy. So that, 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 that you've been talking about this sort of correspondence mm. uh, between mm. uh, and and mentioned Spinoza and the notion of uh, the Spinoza idea that there's a singular substance in the infinite variation. Mm. Yes. I think that uh, yes. that's something which is going on with this work. And when I look at the heat of uh, drawings over there, <laughs> you know, that you're trying to revisit something essential. Mm over and over again with this sort of reiteration. And yet it's always different. Yeah. yeah. Yet it's always Brian, different. can I ask yeah. you, what's the dynamics between that object hmm. and the 
microbiology of the rest, as it were. I, I mean, this mm. one here. Oh, that, this one. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, one, one of the things that I, I, I am very in, interested in is, is um, if you don't, if you if you stop making things and you're interested in what is already there, then one of the ways that things what is already there changes is by what you put next to it and the context you see it in. Mm. And what I hope is the case with this as a as a sculpture, if you like, yeah, um, is that you don't see it. Well, are you none of you guys can see it now in isolation from these, I would guess. And given the context of that then this thing emerging from a piece of wood. Mm. The, 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 the spiral form, the repetition of the shape yeah. um, is something which creates a very, it, is a, it becomes a real metaphor. Mm. You know, that, I think that could stand, that, that object could stand as, as a real metaphor. It's, it's, it's real, it's not deliberately constructed in, in, in that sense, absolutely as an object, although bits of it are being, um, and yet it, it, it has a metaphoric resonance. Mm. It's that idea that a lot of people have about the abstract, really, that you can't stop it from meaning and and i think that by going back to trying not to be in charge of mark making almost trying to just let it happen that was very liberating for me because the meaning didn't go away it re remade itself mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and opened up all sorts of other ways of, uh, of working so do you think in the work there's a um, kind of oscillation between those two things then almost like um, the, the oscillation between representation and abstraction yes they do okay and I, and I think there's um it's why it's interesting to bring these things into relationship with other kinds of images. So to bring them into relationship with a photograph, to bring them into relationship with, um, with a representational drawing. So, you know, th these are sort of to bring them into relationship with text is, is, um, is, is something that, that begins to, um, I mean, text is a kind of ghost. It's like a example. force field, isn't it? Where you're, um, <coughs> taking it away from the material a little bit by the context, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and moving it towards metaphor. It's the context which is helping it, it, it gravitate is. towards it, one end or the other. It I is. Guess, I mean, it? there's one painting over here, which I don't know if I'm, uh, which is, I just, just was working on the other day. And um, you see that, do you see that that's um, the mountain is upside down? Yeah. But it, it also fits into the, the context there. So mm. I think there's a sort of, there's a little, for me, there's a little catch in, in seeing something as a mark and something as a representation, which is so much of beautiful Chinese and Oriental art is based on that simultaneity of the mark and the representation, which is not in Western art in the same way. Mm -hmm. Similarly, you know, as a word and a picture, which is not in Western art in the same way. But that sort of ambivalence and where you looking for pattern, I'm interested in, you know, the sort of raw sash sort of thing. and. And, and where pattern breaks down and where recognition breaks down and where recognition just arrives. These are really interesting visual places that hopefully, ideally, might, so that the result of the painting might be for us to think about our own ability to, to what's happening when we're looking and what's happening when we're making sense of images. And yeah, I was going to ask you, my text. next question was, what's the kind of payoff? So you can observe that thing and obviously you've exploited it in your own work. Um, but I guess it's, you know, what's it the avenue to, or uh, where does it get you that may be mm. pure representation or pure abstraction, if there's such a it, thing, or, it, or just exploiting materiality, yeah. you know, would get you? It's research. And um, I've given up the notion of having to think of an idea and then make a picture about it. Now the pictures have the ideas and I follow them up. So they're thinking and I'm... Mm. It's, it's much more relaxing. It's much more relaxing to let them do the work than to have to feel that you've got to generate the ideas. The ideas are generated by the pictures, and I follow them. So in that sense, it is research, which might be quite nice. That's mm. to finish on.